to go to actually see a Facebook Live event. It should just pop up. We're live now, guys. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Latino Policy Forum and the Chicago Urban League, welcome to our second conversation in our Reimagining Unity in Black and Brown Communities series, as today we're going to discuss social justice. My name is Riyad Kazmi, and I am your moderator. I am a proud alumni of the Chicago Urban League's Impact Leadership Development Program and extremely honored to be here today as a man of color and especially as a Black man who is married to a Latina. Now, before we get started, I wanted to lay out a few quick housekeeping items. First, and most importantly, questions. If you look in the chat, we have a Q&A box where you can put in your questions there, um, and we will do our best to get to all of them. Please know that since there are so many people tuning in, there's a high likelihood we're not going to get to all of them. So what we are going to do is record all questions, and we will provide as best of answers as we can in an appropriate format. You will be informed what that format is. Uh, in addition, we are recording this today, so you can have this for future viewing pleasure, and or you can also watch this live on Facebook as we're streaming through Facebook Live. And then finally, we're going to introduce our panelists, then we'll answer some questions that we have for our panelists, and then we'll take some of those questions from our many guests. Now, since we're short on time, I'm gonna introduce our two distinguished panelists and true boss ladies, Sylvia Puente, who's the executive director of the Latino Policy Forum, and the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson, who's the president and CEO of the Urban League. Let's get started with Ms. Puente. Sylvia Puente is the director of the Latino, executive director, excuse me, of the Latino Policy Forum, the only Latino public policy and advocacy organization in Illinois. Puente has earned a national reputation as a bridge builder and a trailblazer and has even been recognized by Hispanic Business Magazine as one of the most 100 influential Hispanics in the US. Puente is a proud Chicago native and is in the first in her family to graduate college, earning an economics degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She did some of her graduate studies at the Harvard Kennedy School and received her master's from the Harris School of Public Policy here at the University of Chicago. Puente was selected by Governor J.B. Pritzker to serve on his transition team and has served on numerous gubernatorially appointed commissions. <clears throat> Sylvia is a fellow of Leadership Greater Chicago and a recipient of a fellowship from the Chicago Community Trust. She's been awarded numerous awards from the University of Illinois, University of Chicago, LULAC, the Illinois Latino Legislative Caucus Foundation, Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the National Museum of Mexican Art, and the NFL, which is awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Puente. I'm going to go ahead and also introduce our second distinguished guest, the Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson. The Honorable Karen Freeman Wilson joined the Chicago Urban League as president and CEO at the beginning of 2020. Having a deep commitment to public service, Karen most recently served as mayor of her hometown of Gary, Indiana. She was the first female mayor and first black mayor of Gary um, in this, and not only the first black mayor of Gary, generally speaking, she was the first female black mayor in Indiana history. Prior, KFW served as the Indiana Attorney General, Director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission, and presiding judge of the Gary City Court. Also, she served as the Executive Director of the National Drug Court Institute and CEO of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, where she currently serves as the board's vice chair. The mayor is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. She's the immediate past president of the National League of Cities and past chair of the Criminal and Social Justice Committee of the United States Conference of Mayors. If you can't tell, like I said earlier, we do have two boss ladies making it happen. So Sylvia, we are going to kick off the first question with you. Here's a little bit of background. Last week, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was found guilty of second degree murder and the death of George Floyd. And as a result, many people expressed some relief that his conviction represented some level or measure of justice. Here's your question. What were your reactions to the verdict and how do you think it will affect accountability of law enforcement officers when it comes to policing in black and brown communities? 
So thank you, Rehad, and thank you, um, Chicago Urban League and Karen and all the staff that are here and the forum staff that have helped put together this conversation, this second conversation, how we're reimagining black and brown unity um, in our city. And knowing that Chicago is often the focus of, a, often has a national focus, we hope that this public conversation can really be an example uh, for how we move forward as a nation. I think just given this moment of racial reckoning and widening inequality that we see that's just so pervasive across our city, our state, and our nation. Um, so having said that, I also want to maybe give a little bit of a disclaimer and that I think that obviously this couldn't be a more timely conversation, uh, certainly given what's happened in our city recently, and also given the video that was just released uh, an hour or so ago, which I can share a little bit more about later. Um, but, you know, I think like everyone else, I think that in some ways, everything we're going to talk about today is, I can't promise new news, right? I think that everything that we're going to talk about today, in terms of how we address and move forward, so many of the challenging issues has been said already. Um, but I think that we are going to have an engaging conversation. And I do believe that change has to begin with lifting up the discourse and having the conversation. And if we don't create the place and the space to have a conversation, we can never get to solutions. But I wanna say that we all know that we're in a time where we need to get to solutions. So having said that, um, I was remembering my reaction to the verdict uh, last week and realized that I think like many, many reactions, I, I had been holding a lot of stress and tension in. You know, I had been, following the trial, but certainly not following every single day and every movement, but hearing the major news about it, but also just wanting to stay focused on everything else that I've got on my plate and that I've got to focus on. But my personal reaction, uh, and I'm sharing here folks, was I, I wept. <laughs> I wept and I don't think I was alone in weeping. Um, certainly in the, my friends and colleagues that I've talked to, because I just realized how much energy that I'm holding and we're all holding around this moment with some of the challenges that, that we see. So I wept to release stress. I wept to release pain. I wept to release frustration, um, but also know that weeping isn't enough, right? And so to what extent is this gonna move forward? I, I really wanna highlight something that I heard the Attorney General of Minnesota speak to, uh, Keith Ellison. And he, he provided for me, I think a significant reframing. Uh, the, the, the verdict on Chauvin and, and with George Floyd is a moment of accountability, but I don't know that it will ever be a moment of justice because just as we have lost his life, we've lost countless other lives that are similar to his um, and have seen them in our own city in, in recent days. So it is a moment of accountability, but I have to confess that the cynical side of me said it, um, weighed in and said, okay, so I'm glad he was found guilty on all three counts, but what's the sentencing gonna be? And is the sentencing gonna fit the crime and there will be, will there be accountability around the sentencing? And for me, it is about accountability in that moment, in this particular instance, right? But justice is going to be, how do we reform the systems so that we don't see future, so we don't continue to see what we have seen and continue to see more lost lives at the hands of police. That makes sense. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, you know, when you talk about what the sentencing will be, you know, that really jumps into kind of a legal framework. So Karen, I'm going to move to you, uh, former Madam Mayor, judge and attorney general. Um, you can tell a little bit about what your reaction was to the verdict, but really what I would appreciate if you could answer was, how do you think it's gonna actually impact and affect accountability for policing in our black and brown communities? Um. So first and foremost, let me just um, say thank you first to Rayad for hosting the conversation um, and then to Sylvia and the Latino Policy Forum for the partnership 
that um, is evolving between our organizations and, and for having this critical conversation at such um, a telling time in our country. And, and so when you talk about the reaction to the verdict, it wasn't very different from what Sylvia really described and talked about, but the lawyer in me went immediately to what will the sentence be? And it bit, went to the sense that this is just one instance. And um, I talked about, uh, because we issued a statement that I wrote, I talked about catching a glimpse of justice because it really was evidence of what could happen if we reform the system and that we wouldn't have to all be sitting on pins and needles mm -hmm. hoping that people did the right thing because it would be a given that when someone choked someone to death in front of everybody, kids, adults, that it would be a given, oh, that person's going to jail for a long time, right? Because they essentially murdered someone in public, whether they were an officer or someone who was not held to that higher standard. And so when you ask me about the legal reaction, Rayat, what I began to think about was, because we had just seen what happened in Brooklyn Center, right? We had seen Dante Wright uh, murdered. And we didn't even know about what would happen in North Carolina and what would happen in Virginia and what would happen in Ohio. But I had, I had been thinking probably for the last three months about what a national framework would look like if we are to ensure that there is not incident after incident after incident. Otherwise, the country will continue to be traumatized. We have to have um, a national standard of immunity when immunity isn't in place. We have to have a national standard of, of certain measures that cannot be used by law enforcement, no chokeholds, no you know, we have to have those standards. We have to have some guidelines as to what law enforcement should or should not do. I'm not saying to be totally prescriptive, but there have to be some guardrails because now we're off the rails, right? We, we, we don't have any standards. And so you have 18,000 departments and these smaller departments, I mean, you know, you have uh, systemic issues in Minnesota and Louisville and in other places. There's no doubt in Chicago, we have some systemic issues, but we also have um, small rural and small departments, whether they're urban or rural, who have no clue that their system is broken. Right, <laughs> which is terribly sad. And, and to specifically go off. It's frightening. Yeah. It is frightening. I was um, in rural Louisiana not long ago. And I stopped at a gas station before dawn. And I was kind of thinking to myself, am I in the right place or I'm in the wrong place? 
nobody should have to think that way in America in 2021. We just shouldn't. You're hundred percent right. I mean, one of the questions we're going to talk about in a second will really, you know, speak to you, one of those key terms you talked about, which was trauma. And then you talk about the emotional effects because of what you just said. So really quickly, before I ask that question, though, um, thanks to the team, we have here um, the, a quote from the New York Times and some data that they reported from the time that testimony began on the Derek Chauvin trial on March 29th to uh, the actual end of trial. Uh, this is unbelievable. At least 64 people, and the reason why we use at least is because there's more that keep coming up. At least 64 people died at the hands of law enforcement nationwide. That amounts to about three killings per day. And as we know, of that 64, more than half were brown and black people. Specifically, most recently, 13-year-old um, Adam Toledo was shot and killed. And as Sylvia alluded to earlier, um, there is video that was just released on another shooting on yep. Alvarez uh, that folks will be able to check out today. So while the circumstances are different though, in every single incident, so we cannot, we cannot brush a stroke and say, everything's the same. There are different incidences that occur, but what we can brush a stroke is more than half of those people just in the time of testimony, which was seven days, 64 people were killed. Yep. Um, and that's, that's unbelievable. So even though it's not the same across the board, we do have a normalizing of police violence in black and brown communities. And so here's the question for you both, um, and either of you can answer first. What are you each hearing in your own communities and circles about the emotional effects of these incidents? And how have your organizations assisted in trying to quell some of that traumatic or emotional distress that people are feeling? That Karen, maybe you should lead this one off since you just started about that. You know, um, I think that we all underestimate the trauma of violence, of violence in our community. And um, I'm, I'm taken back to this summer when we were doing our back to school giveaway and it was a drive through but a lady pulled into our lot with a sense of urgency and she parked. And I went over to tell her, oh ma'am, you don't have to park. You don't have to get out because it's COVID still, right? It's June. And she said, no, I, um, and maybe no, it was August. And she said, no, uh, my baby, her granddaughter, four year old, was upset because she had just seen a funeral procession. And so as soon as I saw the baby in there crying, I opened the door and she jumped out into my arms. I don't think people really understand the level of trauma that people experience on a daily basis and not just people, black and brown folk, our children, um, because they're more likely to know someone who has died, whether it's at the hands of the police or not as a result of gun violence. And so we have to acknowledge that and we have to come up with measures. And so in our youth services department, there is, a team that is equipped to deal with this trauma. But I think where we've fallen short and where we don't really have even that referral ability is to deal with the trauma that we as adults encounter every day and the fact that even though many of us were glued to the trial in Minneapolis and um, are always looking at these events as they unfold, we don't recognize and don't have 
an appropriate outlet if we haven't developed it personally for a community response. Now, you know, the great thing is that Jose and his group did healing circles um, right around the time that the verdict came out, right around the time that the Toledo, Toledo um, video was released because they knew that that was important. But there has to be almost a systematic uh, approach to allowing our communities to heal and to keep the scab from being ripped off over and over again. And again, I go back to having a systemic um, approach to holding to accountability so that folks won't fear that this is just going to be another instance of a person being killed at the hands of authority and not being held accountable, not having that person held accountable. Um, totally concur, Karen, that we need to go beyond the very good intentions and efforts that are underway to having a more citywide, systemic, neighborhood by neighborhood, school by school, community by community response. So while the Latino Policy Forum, our focus is primarily policy, we don't offer direct services. Uh, and this is not one of the issue areas that we have an historical investment in. What I can share is that um, the Latino Policy Forum has, has, and last time I spoke about our Leadership Academy, which brings together black and brown community leaders who really work in neighborhoods. And that's really led in, in our organization by uh, Nicole Ward and a tremendous group of committed leaders who have gone through our program over the past four years, who also sprang into action to offer peace circles, moments of silence, opportunities for sharing the grief among the graduates, but also uh, finding those opportunities to share those moments of grief and rage and outrage um, in communities across the city. In particular, and, and again, they're all doing this as volunteers. Um, one of them, they, as part of their projects, once they finish our leadership program, is it's a group called Healing Every Youth. And most and the participants who have gone through our leadership academy, most of these participants in this group work in youth services. And they have put together several sessions where they have brought together youth from various parts of the city, again, black and brown youth that might not normally cross neighborhood boundaries. Uh, some of them are, are social workers and mental health workers, and they've created opportunities for youth to be able to express and try to address some of the trauma that's going on through healing practices, through art therapy. So we're gonna continue to invest with our leaders in that program. Then the forum has also recently, uh, we are rebooting our Illinois Latino Agenda, which is a group of committed Latino leaders from throughout the city. And we have, uh, especially given the Adam Toledo situation, which we wrote a statement on, um, and now what we've heard just today, the tragedy of this young man, Anthony Alvarez, who I have not seen the tape, um, but I understand he was shot in the back as he was running away and literally says to the police officer, why did you shoot me? So I just need to take a moment for that because it's just so raw. Um, we are, you know, like all of us, we are, we have asked them um, just today or yesterday, I sent a, a, an email to the mayor's office and asked for a meeting with the mayor this is, um, superintendent of schools or commissioner for police so that we can really talk about how do we have further investment in our communities uh, of to deal with the trauma, more community outreach workers, more youth workers, more mental health practitioners, more social workers. And this is something, and I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit later as we build and strengthen our partnership um, with, the Urban League and each of our respective communities 
figuring out what our collective agenda on this is something I think where we can really, if this is not the moment in time to really figure out how to address that, I don't know what, what is. And some of it is just some really basic things like for all that we keep repeating this scenario over past years and in recent days, as Rehad was speaking about, when I heard that New York Times number, Rehad, I was just blown away that, you know, we're talking about the ones that are in the media today, but acknowledging that this is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And Forever, quite frankly, right? It's so just now it's popular. I don't want to say popular, but now since we have, uh, I think a lot more of a groundswell across communities. Um, it has helped bring this more so to light and make it more public facing. But yeah, I'm gonna get into the next question. Go ahead and finish Sylvia. And then I'll yeah, no, no, but, but, but to your point, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly right, right? I mean, we have the visibility of this more because of social media, because we all have cameras on our phones. But, um, and, and, but so, so yeah, so we are all working and, and with good intentions, and I know it's just not the Urban League and just the forum, but many across our city are determining how to respond to this crisis and what kind of trauma counseling that we can provide to our youth. But I really recently spoke to a group of mothers who have lost sons um, who are also asking how do our voices get elevated in this conversation. So that's a third concrete action that we're taking and that we are gonna make sure to include those mothers in our conversation with the mayor and the mayor's office, we're going to help those mothers tell their story and do some kind of a, either a blog or a video on that. But one of those mothers said to me and following up on the story that you told Karen, you know, in, and she was a mother from Little Village, um, you know, we don't have enough youth centers, art centers, uh, programs to keep our youth engaged in our, in our neighborhood which of course we need more of. But what we do have is an altar on almost every single block. Yep. An altar that commemorates someone who died on that corner. And this is what our children see. And this is what our children see growing up. And it's normalized. Uh, and the, yep. Exactly, and this is how we normalize death and violence. And when she said that, it was just, you know, we think about all the layers of trauma, right? the layers of trauma that this is what our babies are growing up with and just seeing that, yeah, this is, this is, this is what happens. And it, it's almost like the pandemic has been counterproductive as it relates to engaging our kids because of COVID so many places have been closed, had, they've not had access to, and we understand that because you have to keep them safe, but you will have 24 seven access to the streets. Right. And that's the challenge because ch children are still children. Youth are still yeah. young. They're not gonna stay in the house. Right. Right. Well, I mean, so that, that really leads us to this next question. How do you respond to comments that you may hear from some folk that a person could have avoided being shot had they complied or this crazy idea that people are shot by police because they bring it on themselves? Have you guys, either of you, Sylvia or Karen, heard this from someone in, uh, in your circle? I'm sure you got them straight, but can you tell us how you respond to that? You know, I, I had to say to it, some people within her own fam my own family, what was he doing out at 2.30 in the morning? Where was his mother? And that was some of the initial narrative. And I think we also need, all need to take a step back from that. And uh, I don't know if my mother's watching, mom, but I'm going to you know, with a lot of love here, I'm gonna call you out and I'm gonna say, mom, do you know how many times my brothers when they were teenagers snuck out in the middle of the night? Because it is every, every parent who's had a teenager knows that there are those acts of rebellion, right? Big, big and small. So I had to say to my mother, did you, do you know how many times my brothers snuck out in the middle of the night? You don't because they never told you. Um, but they would, walk, they would go out in the middle of the night walking the streets. But in the community where we lived, we and you and I didn't have to worry about them getting shot by the police, right? So it really is how do we change the narrative to say, you know, and now we're learning that it's specifically in the case of, of Adam, that, um, you know, he, he had his, what is it called? His, his IAP, right? In terms of him 
in, in terms of his, his school, his challenges around school, right? So he, he really had so many challenges. And while yes, we all hold individual responsibility, we really need to lift up and look at what is the systemic response and how we have failed, failed him. And, and I wanted to say, just I want to make sure I don't forget this. I want to acknowledge it as we're having this conversation. We understand that the predominant number of deaths at the hands of police in our, in our city and across the nation are to black young men and to black boys, right? It is also an issue in the Latino community, but it is not as pervasive. But I think what these two most recent incidents have told, told us is it is becoming more and more pervasive. Right, and in terms of how it, how it, the the pain that's inflicted on both our black and our and our Latino communities. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and say that, and that it really is, you know, how do I think we move together to foster what some of the systemic um, systemic solutions are, as you were saying here. And and Silver, you're 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 right, and uh, you know, but we're stronger together, right? Exactly. And so. The fact that it's happening in our two communities more than it would ever happen in any uh, predominantly white community is something that uh, really speaks to the strength in numbers. But Rayad, I, I wanted to respond to your question as to what I say, because I will tell you that, you know, I'm no longer the diplomat that I had to be when I was in elected office, right? And, uh, and I also think it comes with age. Um, although, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still try to be um, diplomatic, but here's what I say to people, whatever happened to the benefit of the doubt, right? Because if you look at those incidences where Dylan Roof, was taken into custody, where the gentleman up in Wisconsin with the assault weapon was still walking around uh, when the police took him into custody, and where these countless other white men who have uh, assaulted other folks are taken into custody unless they die at their own hands and given the benefit of a trial. Now, that has to be because they're viewed a certain way. And so we really need to look at how our black men, how our brown men, how our black men and brown, our black boys and brown boys are looked at and are viewed as being more of a threat, as being less likely to comply, as being more dangerous. And, you know, let me just be clear, that's not just outside of our community. Mm. You know, what do you do when you see a young man walking down the street? Mm -hmm. You cross the street? Yeah. Do you immediately right. get, you know, nervous? So if we have those apprehensions, mm -hmm. what do you think other folks do? But here's the difference. As a trained law enforcement officer, while you have the right to go home, you also should be trained in a way that, that's, that it doesn't come down to that split second decision. And so the policy relative to foot pursuits, I mean, because I don't know, it's been a long time since I prosecuted and defended criminals, but I did it for a long time. I don't remember during the course of that time seeing all of these people getting shot in the back when they're running away. I just don't. And, and to your point, Karen, it's about how do we give 
people the benefit of the doubt, right? How do we change concrete policy, right? But there's also just a whole nother level of consciousness and awareness and, and uh, in terms of how we see, to your point, how we see young black and brown men, right? That, that the, the mantra of shoot to kill, right? Really needs to be changed that the mantra of, you know, and, you know, even law enforcement officials I have in, in my own family, right? How do we see this as a child or a young person first versus someone who potentially is gonna kill me? And until we can change that level of awareness, that level of consciousness, until that becomes part of our police training, you know, we have clearly seen the increased militarization of police Yep. And this is, I think, one of the unfortunate and regrettable consequences that we don't see, um, that we don't see our black and brown youth as children, as youth, that we don't see their humanity, that we don't see them as our son um, or someone's son, and that the first reaction is to shoot versus to not chase or to de-escalate. Um, as to de-escalate. So it's concrete policies that we need to change, but also the training that we need to change in terms of how we see and perceive our youth. And so your I'll point, go ahead, Karen. no, I was just going to say to Sylvia's point, the, the time that it will take that training to kick in really does speak to the need for standards that will at least ensure accountability in the process. Because even if I'm adding, and we did this um, in the city of Gary in 2018, we had implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. And every officer went through that training. But that one training is not going to impact that veteran officer who's been on the department for 15 years, like it might impact someone who's in their first five years. And so you're going to have to have something that will go with that training to change the behavior of that veteran officer. Well, and to your point about the implicit bias, right? And these are hard conversations to have and for people to be able to do that level of self-reflection. But to your point, I mean, we give the benefit of the doubt to a young white man in Wisconsin who was carrying a rifle who had already murdered two people and he was taken in to custody nonviolently. And yeah. he had already killed people, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You know, just the logic of that defies me, <clears throat> right? And if that doesn't call out the need for how we perceive um, people as dangerous or not dangerous and that level of implicit bias, I don't know what does. And, and you know, if we're gonna be frank, we saw the same thing on January 6th in our nation's capital. Oh, That's right. what I was about to say. I mean, the, <laughs> the ultimate, to sum up literally everything you guys have said, the ultimate example is insurrection that occurred. Right. I mean, we don't even need to speak any further, right? These were, right. I hate to say it, I only saw, this is unbelievable, and the only reason I know this is because the new CNN showed it. Of all of the coverage that I saw, I literally saw a very homogeneous, again, this is stereotyping, right? But a homogeneous look, a, a cultural representation of people. Now, oh, I would have thought they were all white until last week when they were showing a recap of it there was literally a black man that said, I'm black and I'm here. And which, so that clearly was a joke, had to be, right? <laughs> so you guys nailed it. So, so, so this leads us to actually a question from the chat. I know we have other questions we wanna get to, but I do wanna get to this question. You guys have both spoke about imp implicit bias. You both spoke about clearly there is a differentiation, whether it is consciously or unconsciously that occurs when law enforcement acts. Um, how do we then change beyond just that one training, beyond multiple trainings, how do we change that black and brown kids are the same as white kids since you guys just use Wisconsin, for example, and since you just use insurrection as example, how do we change that? What do we do? 
I, I think it really speaks to how we approach this generally in society, right? It's not just the police. Let's be clear. Mm. It, it, the, you the said it impact, first, Karen, not to cut you off, not to cut you off, yeah. but you said it clearly. Yeah. We're walking down the street and we see some young people. We might cross the street. I'm gonna be honest, as another black man, I'm cool with my young people. But if I'm feeling a certain way, if I feel something, I'm gonna cross the street and just keep walking. And most of the time, 99.9% of the time, everything is fine, it wasn't an issue. But if we as people of color get that, how do we then change that to everybody else? So I appreciate you saying that. And, and, and so we have to acknowledge that. And that's why the work that is going on in many of our corporate boardrooms, the work that is going on in many of our governmental um, institutions. That's why that work is so critical because it's more widespread. The, the importance of the work that's going on with in, in the police realm is that they have the tools of life and death at their disposal on a routine basis. And so when they make a biased decision, it could literally cost someone their life. So that's important. But I think in order to really change the fabric of society, it has to go on in every arena and every arena has to embrace it uh, in the faith community. And, and uh, in last June, I had the honor of having that conversation with Pastor Kent. But you know, we all know that Sunday is the most, uh, most segregated day of the year, of the week, Sunday. Black folks go here. Latinos go there, white people go here, more often than not, with the exception of city church and some of the other more diverse congregations. But, you know, so we have to have those conversations in every possible arena to get people to engage in the self-reflection that Sylvia talked about. You're so right. Sylvia, will you answer this question for me? I'm sure you wanted to say something there, but I've got something for you that plays off of that. Some people, right, are saying that we already have so much self-inflicted violence in our own communities. Why are we only talking about one side of the story? How do you respond when some of those individuals then say, you're a greater threat to yourself, you're black, black, brown, brown, whatever community you live in, than the police are to you as a threat? How do you respond to that? I would not, I would say it's not either or, it's both and, and they're right, right. I mean, I, you know, I, I know I can be controversial when I say it is genocide in our communities, right? It is genocide in the Latino community based on the block that you live on or the side of Western or National Avenue that you grew on, grew up on, that causes you to see this person who looks just like you and whose parents may have come from the same village in Mexico as an enemy. Right, so we must address that, right? It is crucial that we address that and figure out how to promote that peace and their broader representation. But I would never say it's either or because it's both and. The fact that we see the violence within our own communities seeded by all the social ills and the economic inequality and everything else and lack of opportunity that we know exists does not mitigate or excuse the violence that we're seeing of police on our black and brown youth. So we really must consider both, both and, and not either or. That's really good, thank you. I, I, before we go to the last question we had, this really plays into it. Um, and I want to personally thank the person um, who is an anonymous attendee who provided this question, but. I want to actually read it rather than paraphrase it. I'm curious if you have any suggestions for how non-Latinx white people can support black and brown unity when we hear black and brown individuals say negative things about each other or another group. I struggle with not wanting to overstep or invalidate black and brown people's opinions or experiences of discrimination. 
should we just focus on addressing racism within white communities, which is obviously the root of violence against black and brown communities? Or is it something we have to deal with collectively? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Good luck. Well, I guess what I would say to that, you know, I mean, whenever we see injustice, we have to speak to it. I, I understand and appreciate um, the person who asked the question's response of wanting to be sensitive to not probably wanting to proselytize or be condescending uh, to people that they know in, in the black and brown community. But I think it, it can be just as simple as, hey, where is the love, right? You know, how are you, you know, you know and, and even to acknowledge and say, hey, I don't wanna overstep here. And so tell me to be quiet if, if I'm really overstepping, but, uh, and it's not my place, perhaps it's not my place to open it up, right? To open it up by, can we have a conversation around this? Can I say this in a way that hopefully it can be heard? You know, but the bottom line, I think whenever we're seeing this, any of these kinds of situations is, you know, how do I see uh, our youth with humanity, right? And how do we see them with the love that they deserve? And th that love is love and that truth is truth, whether it's the violence that exists within our respective communities or between our communities. And I would also say to that person is, so just lead with a question, how can I be a good ally, right? And you may get a different response from every single person that you've talked to. I don't know that there's a uniform way to be a good ally, but what I always appreciate is that when people open up, open it up and ask, and then we can at least have a conversation on it. Karen, what about you? I agree with that approach. Um, and a lot depends on the context. If it's a good friend of yours, then you can take them to task, right? And say, um, you know what? There are enough folk who think a certain way uh, that you don't need to add that fuel to the fire. Mm. You know? But um, I, I like the approach of really talking to them about how to be a good ally. And, um, and, and allyship is so important in this day and age. We've been working um, with uh, a number of organizations, but uh, specifically uh, both ADL and, um, oh gosh, so, uh, the Jewish Defamation League as well. Um, and it's because we understand the importance and the necessity for allyship in, in this very critical time. So it looks like um, <clears throat> I'm gonna tie in a guest question with our last question. Uh, so hear me out for a quick second. Both of your organizations advocate for changes in policies that have a disproportionately negative impact on black and brown communities. And we know that both black and Latino residents of Chicago face disadvantages when it comes to access to quality education, good paying jobs, overall economic security. So tying these two questions together, the guest question was, should we be talking about the root causes mm -hmm. of crime and what's negatively impacting our communities with what are some of those policy solutions or concrete ways that we can support our communities when it comes to the economic and social challenges that they face, which oftentimes, you know, this isn't just us saying this, right? This is actual statistics. A lot of times this is occurring in disadvantaged communities because of like you started out with Sylvia and Karen talking about resources and availability and access to things and opportunities for youth. Um, Oftentimes that leads to interactions with police or even just negatively impacting the community. So Sylvia, would you start with what some of those policy solutions are, whether Latino Policy Forum has already done it or something that you're going to do to help address these root causes? And then Karen, I'll go to you concerning the Urban League after. Yeah, so it is both and again, right? It is, yes, we must address the root causes. Yes, we must invest in our communities. Yes, we must make sure that every child is safe in our city. Yes, we must have a place for youth to be engaged after school um, so that they can keep themselves occupied and, and know that they have other choices and they know other options. 
Um, and so, as I mentioned, the forums work around this is largely through our Multicultural Leadership Academy, where we really count on those community leaders to show us the way through our Latino agenda and through our Acuerdo network, right, which are all the groups that are on the ground that are in direct relationship and providing resources and services to the families in need and in crisis. The forum's role in this is how do we elevate that? How do we have the conversation mm -hmm. with our political leaders, um, with our community leaders so that we can have a cohesive unified res response? But again, as I think I said when we opened, we know this is very complex. We know it is ongoing and sustained, right? It really is gonna take all of us together to figure out what those responses are and need to be. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe one hope is, you know, we're gonna have a huge investment from our federal government, uh, given what the president's gonna talk about tonight. How do we make sure those resources get directed and redirected for all the critical needs in, in our community? And, you know, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but we have a police consent decree in this city. And we know that the timelines uh, for those, the majority of the timelines set for action on those consent decree responses have not been met. So how do we really step up um, and have accountability from our police, from our city council, from our mayor, from our local community leaders, uh, so that there is accountability for, well, that the police have all the resources they need to comply with that consent decree, but that we also have accountability since the majority of those deadlines have not yet been met. And then I think we get down to, you know, some basic police policies as we were starting to talk about and looking at what is our, the shoot policy, what is the chase policy, what are all those kinds of things. So it's, it's multi-layered. It's not simple as just saying we need to change the policy because the policy won't be enforced if the mindset doesn't change, right? And we've also got to deal with the root causes of why we see so many youth um, with guns in their, with guns, regrettably, with guns in their hands. You know, um, I, I think Sylvia has, has laid it out beautifully. And, um, I, you know, sometimes we get lost in acronyms, so I just want to be clear the American Jewish Committee and the Anti-Defamation League. So I just want to do that. But, you know, we utilize as society band-aids to deal with issues that we face. And I think that if this pandemic has done nothing else. It has presented an opportunity for us to problem solve in a way that we are really addressing root causes. And I say that it's provided that opportunity because we see resources in a magnitude that we have not seen them in a long time. Now, the question is, what do we do and how do we approach it? Do we keep putting Band-Aids? Do we buy a bigger box of Band-Aids? Or do we really look to get at the root cause? And I'll give you one example. We know that education is a game changer for folk. But we also know that different neighborhoods receive different resources for their schools. We know that the federal government is a partner, but also state and local governments are partners. This is an opportunity right now to look at how we fund how we resource education in communities that need it the most. Now, are we going to do that? Or are we just gonna buy a bigger box of Band-Aids? We talk about the wealth gap. We know that home ownership is a huge source of building wealth. 
we just saw in Cranes, the issue of evaluating or assessing property. How do you value a house here? How do you value a house there? And what accounts for that disparity? Mm -hmm. Now, we blame it on the banks, but you've got an assessment issue, you've got an insurance issue, you've got an appraisal issue. Are we going to fix those things? Or are we going to keep pointing to the disparity? Those are the types of things that we have to take on in order, you know, are you gonna have a job training program and then not have people who can pass some of the basic issues in those programs because they haven't had the training or education at a basic level to succeed in those programs? If we're going to deal with barriers to opportunity, we have to be willing to deal with those underlying issues. No, that, that makes perfect sense. Thank you both for that. Um, just as a reminder to our attendees, if you have any questions, please place them in the Q&A box, um, or you can even put them in the chat. We've got um, our great team members from the Urban League, as well as the Latino Policy Forum, who are helping me uh, cast those from the chat when they are there. I'm going to merge two questions here. Uh, we're talking about Black and Brown communities, but oftentimes when thinking about Black and Brown communities, we sometimes forget about the LGBTQ+ and trans members of our black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. So the question for you, um, Sylvia, we'll start with you, then we'll go to Karen, is how do we ensure that they are included, not only in our discussions, but when we talk about any of our law enforcement agencies when it comes to social justice, generally speaking, or criminal justice reform, how do we ensure that they are included in a, at the table to make sure that they are being protected, to make sure that they are also receiving uh, the same rights that we typically face, that they may face at an even more heightened level. What, do, what, what are some of the things you guys think about that? Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, thank you for, the, for bringing that up. And I think it's definitely, we have to think about all of our communities within our communities. We have to think about our LGBTQ community and all the, the questioning and all the variations of that. We need to think about our Latino community that identifies as Black, right? We need to address our own internalized racism in the Latino community with respect to, to the Black community. So I think it's about having that openness um, and that inclus inclusivity. And then as a concrete direct response, what I would say is um, the forum for a long time has had its Illinois Latino agenda which is an open table of organizations that primarily serve the Latino community. We are gonna be giving that a reboot um, and we'll be making an announcement about that in the next couple of weeks. And that is the table that we have helped to set along with many other Latino community leaders to make sure that all those voices, all those perspectives from the diversity within the Latino community and with all of our, uh, among all of our neighborhoods can come together to say what are our policy priorities and how do we really address them? Um, but point noted and, uh, and yeah, it is something that we all, we have to continue to do to walk our talk is to be con in inclusive of all of the communities within our communities. So you won't find a more judgmental group on earth than black folks. Than us, yep. <laughs> I'll say that because I'm black. And what we have to continually do is call out that internal discriminatory behavior, the language, how you refer to people, you know, uh, the derogatory terms that we use. They just can't be okay. We have, and who you think about when you set a table. I mean, do you have every represented group in your family at that table? Because, you know, as, as judgmental as we are, we are always gonna embrace everybody, right? 
And so it seems contradictory, but we really have to utilize that as our superpower to make sure that everybody feels welcome, needed, heard, and accepted. makes that makes perfect sense so we've got a uh, a good amount of questions that came in and we're just so everyone knows we're probably going to go for about another i don't know 13 14 minutes or so and then we're going to wrap up um, with closing remarks but here is a statement i would like to share uh, before getting into the question from one of the attendees in short they say there seems to be very little political will to invest and commit to long-term investment and or policy interactions. With a yes or a no, Sylvia, yes or no? Is there a long-term political will to- Do they, yes. Yeah. The, the, the statement was, there seems to be little political will. So we'll just, you know, go ahead and take the, right to state um, from a government or political perspective to invest in long-term, I think if I would reword it, invest in long-term initiatives that will help cure this problem. So do you agree yes or not agree no? Um, that's a hard one. It's always hard for me to give a yes or a no answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think there are some long-term sustained initiatives and new initiatives that are emerging. But I agree that political will and decisions operate on the political cycle, which isn't as always long-term and sustained as we need it to be. KFW, are you a yes or no? Or are you gonna give a diplomatic answer like Sylvia just did? I would say the political will is there. But the fact that it's political will almost mm. cuts against long-term investment. Wow, preach. Thank, Mavis said and, preach. I'm going to say preach and, to you too. That's a good and, one. And that's because people run in four-year cycles or two-year cycles. Right. And, you know, if people really want to see sustainable change, they have to be willing to give political grace. Because in order to get to that sustainable change, it's going to take time to cobble together a long-term solution because you're going to have to find the dollars. That's correct. No, well, There's a cost. But let's <laughs> mention the dollars, and we haven't brought this up yet. And I have to say that um, we find the dollars when... I, I, I don't accept this, you know, I, I really want to question whether or not the dollars are there. I believe that, yes, we always have to think about the dollars and where the dollars are coming from, but we know how many, you know, what's the figure of over 100 and 180 million dollars of uh, recovery dollars went to the police, right? Mm -hmm. What investments would 180 million dollars, I don't know if that's the quite right, right number, but it was hundreds of millions. Would Let's have take half of them. Creating yep. a community center in every single community you know, more social workers and, and, and outreach workers in, in each of our neighborhoods, right? So it is a question of priorities, right? And in, in that sense, you know, the political will and, and the priorities. And pl please don't hear my remarks as being anti-police, right? But we all know that preventative measures, especially in the early years, are a much more significant return than having to put build more prisons and put more people in jail and what that long-term cost is us. What mm -hmm. we have not been able to do is have the conversation on how we realign resources to what we know works versus figuring out how we deal with what needing to build more prisons and put pe more people in jail. So I do believe there's an opportunity not only with the increased investment of resources that are coming uh, as a result of the American Rescue Plan, but there is also an opportunity to have really hard conversations about how we realign the existing resources that are available. I agree, with, I agree with Sylvia 
I, I agree with that, Sylvia, but I also know that we have to acknowledge the competing interest that uh, particularly that elected officials have. Like you and I have competing interests in our own shops, right? Mm -hmm. But we know that generally people are directed towards good. They just think their project is better than maybe their colleagues' project. But in the world of an elected official, you have people that are saying, oh no, you can't take the vaccine to the jail first because mm -hmm. they don't deserve it, right? Even though that's the first place it ought to go because if you're gonna protect the guards, you need to consider the inmates or how about it's just right to mm -hmm. protect the inmates. That's the right thing to do. But you have folks who really feel justified in saying, oh no, that's not where those resources should be spent. Now you're right. The political will comes in saying, no, I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm still going to vaccinate the folks in the prison because it's the right thing to do. And, and well, I'm, I'm putting in, and I have said a lot about government's role in this and our police role in this. But to your point, Karen, when we're looking about all of our sectors of society, right? I mean, we've seen great models of um, corporate, corporate America and, and local businesses uh, hiring local youth and mentoring local youth. Um, so that they can see that there are, you know, to widen their horizons and see that there are opportunities, right? We know that our faith sector has a big role in this, you know, and that each of us has a responsibility and an opportunity to take a young person that we know to help them get to, to give them some guidance and get them to their next stage. So um, it has to be obviously a multi-sectored response. And I think we each in each sector must decide what it's, course of action is going to be as we move forward on this. I think so, it's also tedious, right? Um, it, there are no easy answers. I, I think about the whole challenge that we see with labor unions. Uh, we're talking about a trillion dollar infrastructure plan that could, and let's say that half of it gets funded. There will be union jobs for the next 10 to 20 years. Who's gonna get those jobs? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. Um, I'm gonna ask a question from one of the guests, but, but what I would chime in and say, when you talk about the competing interests from an elected official or even a government standpoint, I know you even said, even within your two organizations, a lot of the time now, um, even with the stimulus plan, even with the American Rescue Plan, and even the, second stimulus bill um, under this new administration, uh, cities aren't necessarily even in the position to utilize those funds for new things. A lot of it is paying back what they had to spend money for to deal with COVID and the that. pandemic, right? Yeah. Reducing and that. so then you also have to throw that dynamic in, not just about what do we need to do? We also have to pay ourselves back. And so it, it, you guys hit the nail on the head. It, it is very interesting. Uh, this question is for you, Karen. Um, can you please share, we have a young person in the chat, which is awesome. Uh, some of the opportunities that young people have um, when it comes to job opportunities, including job training, et cetera, beyond just you know traditional one summer Chicago or summer jobs programs where you know kids get six to eight weeks to make, you know, however much money, $10 an hour for that six to eight weeks. What about long-term? Can you share some of the things that the Urban League does throughout the year? Um, and if you guys, Sylvia, have anything as well to chime in after that, but I know the Urban League does some stuff. Can you tell us, Karen? Absolutely. And I'm going to ask our team to help by putting some of this in the chat, but we have a solar uh, training program that we do in partnership and have done over the last four years in partnership with ComEd. We have a construct program that we do. It's a training program that allows folks to sort of, uh, it's a pre-apprentice training program to put them on the pathway of getting into the building trades. We have a program that we are doing with uh, Project Hood, 
uh, that's supported by Tiffany and uh, a number of folks where we actually train women uh, in pre-apprenticeship. Uh, it's uh, pre-apprenticeship training for women. We have a program that we are um, now designing called the Urban Tech Program. And it's focusing on cybersecurity and opportunities in uh, the urban tech area, whether it's to be trained in AWS, whether it's to be trained in HVAC, um, you know, so that people can engage in that area. And Karen, uh, and not to jump you off, but sure. excuse me, not to cut you off. I really uh -huh. apologize. But for that young person, what Karen's talking about, these aren't forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollar jobs. These are seventy, eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollar plus jobs. No, and those people need are, to know that. <laughs> you know, we're we're talking about folks making thirty, forty, fifty bucks an hour, uh, mm -hmm. without off the bat uh, over time, and um, and then the other area where we are, you know, really thinking about how can we get some real pathways. You know, one of the things that folks are going to start doing uh, very quick, soon now is paving, is 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 laying concrete, as doing all of that because um, that is what has to be done when you live where we live. You know, we yeah. have potholes, we have uh, crumbling streets and sidewalks. How do I get into the laborers' union? How do I get into the operating engineers? I know that I'm capable because I play video games. And that's essentially what you're doing as an operating engineer. So what's my pathway to training? And so we are working with them to create that pathway at the Urban League so that we can stop saying, oh, you know, you can't get into that labor union because you don't know anyone. I just don't accept that. I just don't accept that. So those are some of the opportunities. And then we just, as a result of the R3 program, um, got a, a an opportunity in the South suburbs and in Markham and surrounding areas, but also to focus on a program for uh, returning citizens. And we're going to do that in partnership with SAFO. And so you all know the R3 program Karen's referring to is tax money that has come from cannabis sales. That's exactly right. Sylvia. And, and, and you know, and the last thing I want to say before Sylvia chimes in is that we have a spectrum of opportunity in our Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. I've learned from my own daughter that not everybody <laughs> in that That's age uh, group is looking for employment. Many of them are looking for support for their businesses. And so we do provide that type of support for young people as well. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the Urban League has a long history in offering this kind of uh, direct training for employment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the forum doesn't provide these kinds of direct services but we have many organizations in the Latino community that do. And so just to name a couple of names and uh, my apologies to my friends whose organizations I won't mention, but Erie Neighborhood House, Chicago Commons, Instituto Progreso Latino are all yeah. organizations and neighborhoods that offer various kinds of employment and training to really help people get that job. And, um, and especially a lot of our youth get that first job. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, even though I said it's more than just government, I want to highlight the data points that uh, your research director, Karen, put in the chat, that Chicago received $480 million in discretionary spending from the feds, and $281 million of that went to the Chicago Police Department. So I had said $180 was actually $280. And I'm sure the mayor and the city has their reasons for that. Right, but, but I think given the moment of time we're in, how do we have a more robust conversation across our city and how this next investment of resources should be spent and should be put in, into our neighborhoods 
And then most importantly, really, how do we really change not just the policies and the biases, but our levels of awareness and consciousness so that we see the humanity in all of us. Thank you for that, Sylvia. And thank you, Karen. So we are now at the point we are going to wrap up with some closing remarks for, from Sylvia and Karen. Um, and I'm gonna actually give them something that they did not know. Um, I received a question from a colleague, she texted me and she stated, and I don't wanna mess it up, so I'm gonna read it. Literature can serve as a vehicle for understanding and social change. Do you have any recommendations? So while you think about that, uh, when you give, think about that now, and you'll share that during your closing remarks. But for me, from a recap, um, I appreciate this conversation, not only to have uh, our great panelists here to, to discuss, because they both are leaders, not only within this city, this state, and this country, um, they're leaders at every level, uh, from the street block, right, all the way up to the White House. And I am honored uh, to, to, to speak with you guys. But if you, if you, you know, think about how we recap this, I think what it was, was, and I love the question, understanding. I think it was acknowledgement, if I'm thinking of words. I think it's respect. And it's not the typical respect we think of when we think of respecting our elders. I think it's respecting each other within our communities. I think it's respecting, it doesn't matter if it's a law enforcement agency, uh, a law enforcement official, or just someone you see on the street, respect. And I think a lot of that sums up into peace. And what, what it seems like some people have thought about that was investment that has really lacked a, a, a piece of disenfranchisement or disinvestment in certain communities in this city has helped lead to where we are now. So thinking about when you guys shared about policy decisions and different ways that we can fix that, it's really incumbent upon all of us and as individuals collectively in our families to take that first step. It may just be going in front of your house and picking up the trash that someone else threw. Little things like that can create a sense of a foundation that can create a domino effect on your block that obviously goes block to block. You know, um, during President Obama's first campaign in 2008, um, one thing he said to us in a meeting was, I'm not thinking that I need to change everywhere. I'm thinking that if I start on my block and I can help the next block and they can help the next block, I get this huge domino effect that extends. And I think that's something that we all can do together. And I think we all should do for one another. So with that, who would like to go first if they found their literature piece that they want to share um, to add. Sylvia, do you want to go first and with your closing remarks and with yeah, that? This is a senior moment where I can't remember, it, <laughs> even though it's I fine. had it. Well, well, two, I would say, I mean, I think to the white ally on the call, I would say white fragility, right? Mm -hmm. Because it really helps understand and how we, you know, in, in terms of our, how do we let go of our defensiveness to really understand what's being said to us by people of color. And then there is the book, um, that really goes back to the time of slavery and just really talks about how we have begun, you know, we're just at another level with our current police state in terms of what things have looked like since that time. And very prominent author, very prominent book that I'm not gonna remember the title of. Uh, but then I'll also add on my reading list is Cast, the new book by um, Isabel Wilkerson. I think that really speaks to the, the same issue that really strengthens and, and, and our understanding of that. So I think that there, there's a lot of good, you know, I also just read the fantastic um, Atlantic piece by Abraham Kendi, um, where he really talks about, do we really have the option to just listen and obey? Because even when we listen and obey, we're, you know, Adam still got murdered, right? And that that's been a refrain, a, a refrain for the past 200 years in terms of saying saying that. So I think there's a lot of good um, literature that's out there. And I think just to end, I'll just repeat my, my comment is, again, how do we get past our own biases, preconceived notions, fears? And to your point, Rhea, teach each other, treat each other with love, respect, honor, dignity, 
and see the humanity that is in all of us. Thank you, Sylvia. Karen? So um, Cast was on my list by Isabel Wilkerson and, um, you know, just a real great framework for understanding um, society. Uh, the other uh, thing that I would suggest is the 1619 series mm. uh, that appeared in the New York Times Magazine, because again, a, a wonderful framework. And because I probably watch more TV than any person who claims <laughs> to be intelligent should, uh, I would recommend this season of Queen Sugar. And that is the own network program that's set in uh, Louisiana, but it really did unpack so much of the last year and do it with um, social commentary that only Ava DuVernay can do with just amazing um, insight and uh, poignancy that, um, you know, for those who are television watchers, I, I would recommend that. Uh, the last thing that I would say is, you know, I cannot tell you all what a fan I am of Sylvia Puente. Uh, she was one of the first folks that I met uh, because we were on a panel, I think for ABC7 uh, during my uh, first year at the league. And every time I sit with her, I gain a new nugget. And one of the early things that she said um, as we were sort of preparing for what we thought would be an easy exit from uh, COVID and uh, the pandemic was that if all we're focused on, and, and I'm paraphrasing, is recovery, then we have missed the mark. We really need to look at how we transform our community as a result of having been in this pandemic. And so I, I just want to say that and, and thank her for just sowing wisdom into me and into so many others uh, in this community. Well, it's a mutual admiration, Sats. Um, mutual admiration, Karen, so please know you have all my respect and thank you for those kind wor words. And the book I was trying to remember was The New Jim Crow. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The Michelle. New Jim Crow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fascinating. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So Sylvia, Karen, thank you so much for your foresight to do this, your mindset, your focus of making sure that our communities come together because as we know, if we're in unison, we're much stronger together than separated. So thank you so much. Also, thank you to all of our attendees today. We really appreciate you participating and being active and involved and engaged in this discussion and really just taking the time out to maybe just not learn, but to be able to connect with possibly like-minded individuals. Again, thank you so much. We hope you'll join us for our third installment of our Reimagining Unity in Black and Brown Communities. You'll hear about when it's coming next and coming soon. All, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Take care now. Thanks.